Bjornsson, is that the way it's pronounced? Yeah? We'll speak on the origins of the common law, or the common law origins of law, that is, one of his pet projects. Kevin uh, is a, has been a, an activist libertarian for a great many years. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was a, a member of the, the organization that preceded ISIL that existed for about one year, the uh, Association of Rational Individualists, which was uh, created in 1968 and later became SIL, which uh, is basically our organization. And uh, he's, he's been an active, active in the Libertarian Party and Libertarian circles in the United States. And this, uh, as I say, is one of his uh, pet projects, the, the uh, study of common law. So, uh, Kevin, are you ready to proceed? You betcha. Yes. Uh, yes, I'll be talking on the natural origins of common law. Now, the common law is not uh, exactly uh, up to libertarian uh, standards, but it's uh, leaning heavily in that direction. Now, of course, intellectual ideas rarely exist in a vacuum. That uh, I admit that, uh, or acknowledge, would like to acknowledge, my uh, indebtedness to Frederick Bastiat and Ayn Rand and the Austrian School of Economics. Um, now, it's my uh, intention here to give a brief overview of natural law, common law, as well as admiralty and other statutory laws. Now, the, um, I will be uh, uh, going by my outline here, but, uh, but many, most of my comments, or a lot of my comments will be extemporaneous. So feel free to interject your own questions or comments uh, during the speech. Uh, I hope to also save uh, a few minutes at the end where we can have an interchange of ideas. Now, I think that the law can be divided into two broad categories. Natural law and positive law. Okay, what is the definition of natural law? That branch of ethics having to do with human justice which provides an objective standard for evaluating human actions involving force against other humans. Now, this uh, theory's been around for a long time. In fact, the great uh, orator and philosopher Cicero, uh, speaking uh, right uh, after the golden age of Rome and when it was starting to degenerate into an empire, stated that true law is right reason uh, conformable to nature, universal, unchangeable, eternal, whose prohibitions re restrain us from evil. This law cannot be contradicted by any other law and is not liable other to uh, derogation or abrogation. Neither the Senate nor the people can give us any dispensation for not obeying this universal law of justice. It needs no other expositor and interpreter than our own conscience. It is not one thing at Rome and another at Athens, one thing today and another tomorrow. But in all times and nations, this universal law must forever reign eternal and imperishable. This, this guy was born about 100 years uh, before Christ. Then, uh, <clears throat> of course, with the Caesars came in and uh, corrupted uh, Rome to the point where it uh, became an empire. Uh, now, the other type of, okay, um, Let's pause here and let's, let's assume that there is no natural law. Well, then what we are left with is uh, very uh, uh, insubstantial grounds for challenging any type of government. Uh, the opposite theory is the consequentialist or utilitarian theory. Now, the Austrian uh, critique of this is that uh, all values are subjective and therefore uh, we have no way of uh, defining what the greatest good is. But even if we accept that there are objective values or objective goods, and let's say we define this as gross national product, for example, we have a tremendous problem of measurement, scientific measurement, and proving that in each individual instance, this particular government action uh, resulted in uh, a certain amount of growth. For instance, you can, you can say that there is a good economy, but in tracing cause and effect, it becomes very, very difficult. I think it's much better that if we follow the rules of common law, as a body, then of course 
uh, the economy will prosper and, and people will be happy. Now the opposite uh, type of law is positive law. Now what I mean by that is not positive in the sense of good. If I may make an analogy to logical positivism, that's, that's the school of thought that, which says that there's no really objective standards of, of reality. That all we can do is talk about language. And um, A.J. Ayer was one of the uh, big expositors of that. Uh, so in, in a similar vein, legal positivism, positivism uh, maintains that there is no objective standard that applies to uh, government statutes or decisions. Now, uh, typically when we think of government, we're thinking of uh, nowadays in the 20th century, we're thinking of statutes because that's how most things are done. Um, and admiralty law is one type of, of statute. Now what admiralty law is, it's the law of the sea. And the opposite type is the law of the land. Uh, now, we, now common law has been called the law of the land because during the medieval ages uh, that uh, most of the uh, uh, government uh, decisions had to do with the ownership of land. And uh, prior to that, <clears throat> Uh, for instance, the uh, Hadrian, the great, the, uh, the Roman Emperor, uh, stated that uh, Rome is where the Roman ar army is. They had no real concept of, of land sovereignty uh, as such. Um, now, uh, also the common law had to do with the rights of people when they were were on the land, and, uh, and so this was this was this is why it's called uh, law, the the law of the land. Now the um, I'll get more into uh, admiralty law later on. Uh, common law is a, is a hybrid. It has natural origins in the sense that it grew out of custom. It also is natural in the sense that uh, <clears throat> there are rational uh, principles that have been used to uh, change it. Uh, this gets us into equity law. But um, basically, it's, um, it's expressed uh, often through uh, judicial decisions, either uh, which came to be written, they weren't always uh, written down though, no. and the old, in the, in the, in the, pa in the past uh, started out as just uh, verbal. Uh, actually these things started out as customs, and so in that sense it can be said to be natural because it involved a spontaneous order of various societies. Um, now uh, Hogan, his Origins of the Common Law, defines it as English common law, as a body of general rules prescribing social conduct enforced by the ordinary royal courts and characterized by the development of its own principles and actual legal controversies by the procedure of trial by jury and the doctrine of the supremacy of law. Now, uh, there's another good book in this area by uh, Sir Henry Sumner Maine, published originally in England in 1861, uh, called Ancient Law. Now, he uh, considers more in terms of the Roman law, <clears throat> which English uh, borrowed uh, considerably from. Now, back then, they, it was called the Law of the Nations, uh, which is not to be confused with international law. But the Law of the Nations, uh, back then, the only nations that they were uh, familiar, this is like in the you know, early days of the Roman uh, Republic, uh, they were several Roman nations or, or jurisdictions. And what was in common with all of them was called the Common Law. Now, the reason this came about is not through some abstract uh, philosophy of let's, let's have something in common, but uh, foreigners who were often wealthy and uh, trading with the uh, Italians would often want to uh, use the uh, law system for lawsuits of regarding property or whatever. And, of course, they did not want to use the legal systems of the foreigners where they came from. Uh, nor could they use uh, whatever law was happening to be in that particular jurisdiction. So they, they are ex extracted from all the uh, Roman jurisdictions the common characteristics. So I think that in a sense this is scientific, it's like an experiment. If you put, I would say that virtually every society, every, every human society, certain common things are, are illegal. Uh, private murder, private theft, uh, rape, etc. No matter what society, they all have these things in common not just uh, Roman societies, but I would say this is worldwide. Uh, the big exception comes about if you're a government official, then somehow it's okay to do that. Um, so now, I do have an academic knowledge of these uh, topics. 
I'm also speaking from experience. I am a victim of the application of admiralty law, as well as uh, the criminal uh, statutes regarding uh, uh, marijuana. And these all con contradict natural law and common law. Uh, I may explain how this came about. Now, I'm the owner of Hydrotech since 1981. I manufacture and retail lighting fixtures for indoor plant growth. Now, this is quite common in Europe, uh, Northern Europe, where the climate is not good for outdoor growing. People are using high-pressure sodium lights in greenhouses. Uh, the United States is, uh, uh, a lot of the people who use these lights are growing marijuana, or actually cannabis sativa, or the English call it hemp. Um, now, uh, I also sell hydroponic supplies. Uh, now, what's happening here uh, with me is that my inventory, now you're talking about Hornberger saying it's right to trial by jury. Well, not always. Doesn't always happen that way. October 26th at 10 a.m. in the morning, I was awoken by a federal marshal. And the marshals and the DEA officials were there, it was about a dozen of them, uh, held me prisoner while they hauled away all the inventory of my store. Now, this is prior to any hearing in which I knew anything about. I was given no prior notice of this, no chance to contest it. The first thing I heard about it was, uh, was when they were right there, hauling everything away. They had a big, a couple of big trucks. All my inventory was uh, wiped out, uh, what they could haul away. The bank account was frozen. Uh, my trucks were almost seized, but they made a mistake in the paperwork and forgot to include them. Um, they were included in, the, I had two stores, one in Oregon, they were included there, but the trucks happened to be in Seattle at the time. For some reason, the house was not seized. I think because uh, the owner of the house that I was buying it from was a little old lady, uh, quite wealthy, and they didn't want to upset her. She was politically, uh, I guess, uh, sacrosanct. So I was able to sell the house before they could put any liens on it. Uh, I, th I guess because this was a part of a nationwide operation, they were obviously uh, busy, bureauc government bureaucrats being incompetent. Uh, it's kind of like the uh, Dunkirk, where the Hitler was overconfident, didn't want to use his panzers and let the British escape uh, and instead of wiping them out. Well, they didn't quite finish the job. I was able to restart my business by selling my house, and I re reinvested the money in inventory and built it back up again. But, of course, I was deprived of uh, due process. Now, almost three years later, I was charged criminally with conspiracy to grow marijuana and money laundering. And the money laundering was the most serious charge, carrying 20 years, and it was rose in the fact that some of my customers uh, were growing marijuana and they paid me money to buy the equipment. So me receiving the money from the customers, in their interpretation, is laundering money. So, and the only proof that they had that I even knew was for marijuana, I had them sign a statement saying it wasn't for marijuana, but, but I, did, I did smoke a joint with them. So this was the only proof that I knew it was for marijuana. There's a lot of people who are smoking who not, are not necessarily growing. Uh, now, the, what happened was they bought uh, $50,000 worth of equipment and shipped it off to Arizona. The person who received the equipment was freaked out and never actually grew anything with it, but we could still conspired to do it. Uh, and because of the large number of equipment, they calculated 5,000 plants and they multiply uh, 5,000 times this grid formula, and it comes out to be quite a number of years uh, if I were found guilty. Now, I was set up with about 18 counts, and the problem with going to trial over that, number one, they'd seized all my inventory, so I had no money to pay for attorneys. Number two, because of the large number of counts, if I were found guilty of even one of them, it would have the same effect as if I'd been found guilty of all of them, because the standard of proof for sentencing is less than the standard of proof for conviction. So, if the judge thinks there's probable cause to believe I was guilty, even though the jury found me not guilty, they could sentence me as if I had been found guilty. 
So in effect, this deprives me of the right to trial by jury, or the trial becomes a sham. They say, well, you can have your trial afterwards. And of course, uh, after, after, after um, this thing is all over with, uh, after we seed your inventory, then you can have your trial. But if you try to get your inventory back, then you have to waive your Fifth Amendment rights because you have to testify at the civil trial. And if you don't testify, you lose automatically. So anything they gain through the civil procedure, they can use against me, they could have used against me later criminally. Now, because of the mess up in their paperwork, uh, I had a very good case to get the inventory back because of the delay. So I filed a motion uh, called a latches motion, which had to pay uh, several thousand dollars. Uh, I've spent approximately a quarter million dollars to attorneys, by the way, over the years. Uh, we filed a motion uh, to return the inventory, which had a very good chance of succeeding. The next day, I was charged criminally. The now, what this does, it has the effect of putting the civil case on hold until after the criminal trial. That's what the judge said. Well, we'll deal with this after your trial. Well, I need the money, I needed the money before the trial to pay for the attorneys. And because of the risk uh, of being found uh, guilty of even one, one charge, what will happen a lot of times is the juries will not realize this. They will not realize the rules of sentencing. They will find you guilty of one charge, figuring that they're going easy on you. Then once the judge gets a hold of it, he sentences you as if you've been found guilty of all the charges. And you can't tell the jury this in, in trial. And if I had n not, I pled guilty to about half the counts in order to get a deal whereby I would be eligible for probation. I'm still awaiting sentencing. If I hadn't taken the deal, they would have kept me in jail until my trial. I almost certainly would have been found guilty of at least one of the charges, and in all likelihood it would have wound up serving, serving 18 years in prison, federal prison. By the way, uh, the drug war is so epidemic in the United States that they're building one prison per month, and it's barely keeping pace with the new influx of prisoners. Uh, by the way, in a sidebar in this IRS thing, uh, I haven't filed since 79. The reason that they were not going after me in the IRS thing is I had a low standard of living and uh, incomplete uh, uh, paperwork, and I wasn't filing. And you can only get away with that if you're self-employed. Uh, the employee, if you're an employee, you have to file because the employer will do it for you. If you don't, it's called a W-2. Um, so that's the best way. If you don't want to file an income tax, become self-employed and live like a, like a monk uh, or a pauper in any event. Um, okay, now a little background on this, uh, this war on drugs. Um, uh, originally, uh, most of the uh, drugs were imported in the United States, uh, even marijuana, which is bulky, or cannabis sativa, I should say. Uh, then the President Nixon, in about 1970, started uh, stepping up the uh, border searches. And as a, consequences, a consequence of that, many people grew the cannabis outdoors in the United States. Well, then with the uh, aerial surveillance, uh, a lot of people moved indoors. So they bought artificial lights and grew indoors. Now, a lot of people grow vegetables, herbs, and flowers indoors as well. But somehow it's supposed to be, my government says it's my responsibility to screen out those customers. Somehow, through ESP or whatever, I'm supposed to sell it only to people that are growing herbs, or legal herbs and vegetables. However, the lights don't discriminate. There's no, uh, they will grow anything you put underneath them. Um, now, this uh, the seizure was uh, justified by the Admiralty Laws. Now, what is the Admiralty Law? It's the law of the high seas, and it was uh, got its biggest application in warfare. What would happen is since England would be, for, for instance, England would be at war with uh, Spain, and they would uh, want to uh, seize all the shipping that was going to Spain. And not having enough uh, uh, ships of war, they would uh, commission uh, privateers like Sir Francis Drake to seize the uh, goods on the high seas. So it was mainly used uh, for warfare. It was also used for salvage of uh, sunken ships. 
And because of this, they had something called in rem proceedings. That means that you could, that the inventory ship or whatever it is could be considered in default because the owner was either in a different country that wish they were at war and couldn't be brought to the proceedings or the owner was not known because the ship was sunk. Now it's an action against the property, not against the owner of the property. And it goes back to, historically to the uh, duo dend of the medieval days where for instance if a car were to accidentally uh, go down a hill and kill somebody the, it would be forfeited to the king. Now, later on, the British Crown tried to expand that uh, type of forfeiture, and in a 1673 decision, the High Court of England uh, limited this type of application. Now, this limitation was uh, upheld in the United States until about 1871, in which interim admiralty forfeiture decisions were okayed if there was a war. Uh, this was in reference to the Civil War. Now, you might think it's strange they're applying admiralty law on the land, but what happened was originally canals, uh, admiralty law applied to, to canals, and then when roads were built, it was con roads were considered like canals, and then it just kind of gradually expanded to, to the point where the law of the seas is now being used on the land. It was expanded during the prohibition of alcohol, but you could not seize the entire estate, only the still or that portion of the estate which was used in the manufacture of illegal marijuana or uh, illegal uh, uh, alcohol. Nowadays, if they find one cannabis seed on a boat, for example, the entire boat can be seized. And in fact, one time they even seized, uh, DEA seized a U.S. government research vessel and they had to return it because uh, the government, of course, uh, one branch, stealing, one hand stealing from the other hand, uh, there was no net gain to the government, so they let it go. Well, what is this now common law? There were other uh, prohibitions in the common law. The Magna Carta, Article 39, prohibited the seizure of a person's means of making a living. A farmer could not have his uh, plow stolen and a merchant could not have his merchandise uh, seized. There was also something called a, uh, in 1166, and a size of novel to scene. If, uh, for instance, uh, somebody seized your, your land and you sued to return it, you were, your land was returned to you uh, pending the result of the trial. Also, uh, uh, Hogue was pointing out that uh, there was a criminal seizure uh, but only after uh, conviction. So there were these traditional limitations which were eroded gradually in the United States uh, in particular. Now the ancient law, uh, there was no, very little statutes as, as we know them today. There were fines for criminal, what we now call criminal violations, there were simply fines. And what would happen is two parties would have a dispute and the government would be a referee. So it isn't the case of the government versus a person. It's two people arguing and the government uh, settling it. Uh, there were, in some cases, legislatures, what we would call legislatures, but they didn't enact statutes uh, with very rare exceptions. Uh, the, for instance, the, the ancient uh, Scandinavians had something called the folk moot, which was the village would elect somebody to go to the assembly of a hundred villages and so on up the line to the point where they had to, uh, they elected the king. So the legislature was seen as a way of electing the king and the reason that it was done this way as opposed to direct election is that in those days they didn't have adequate communications and they didn't know who this uh, distant person was so they had to elect a local people that they were familiar with. So what is natural law? Well Blackstone who was a famous uh, jurist uh, pointed out that the earth and all things therein are the general property of mankind from the immediate gift of the Creator. By the law of nature and reason, he who first began to use it acquired them and in them a kind of transient property that lasted so long as he was using it. When mankind increased in numbers, it became necessary to entertain conceptions more, of more permanent domain. Now this is a flawed but useful analogy or, or point that with the development of agriculture it became necessary to 
define uh, property in a more permanent sense. Now, Sir Henry of Sumner Main, uh, being of the, 18, uh, the 19th century, was very in, into evolution and was against the notion that anything good can come from, from the past. Everything is getting better and better every day in every way. And he's saying that there was no uh, state of nature. Well, I acknowledge the state of nature as painted by Rousseau and, and Locke and, and, and Blackstone was, was simplified. But the point is, not that there was necessarily a Garden of Eden or an ideal state to which we were trying to return, but that we, if we go back far enough, there was, we find that there was no government. Well, but people still had rights. So it's a way of proving that uh, rights exist independently and, and preceded uh, government. And the purpose of government originally was to protect those rights. Now, <clears throat> if we... Um, even if we accept the, the evolutionary hypothesis and say that, it, well, as interpreted by Maine, and say, that, well, there was no state of nature, uh, that there was a, maybe even the war of all against all, as Hobbes stated, I still think we have a second ground for, for uh, rooted, for believing in uh, natural law. That uh, there's something called the law of equity, and this uh, comes from the Greeks, and we'll talk more about that later. Now, the next step after the ancient, the state of nature, began into the uh, tribal chiefs, and this evolved into, or clan chiefs, and this evolved into a chief of the whole uh, uh, tribe, which be began to be known as, as kings. This was the so-called heroic age. And what would happen was the Greeks uh, had a, something called the uh, themis, and this later evolved into the concept of the goddess of justice. And there was something called themistes. In other words, judgments that just existed out there, and, the, and then the person making the judgments just pulled them in from the spiritual dimension and rendered these judgments uh, to people coming before him. Um, and it was considered a divine inspiration. There was no statutes as such. The only, the only uh, statutes were, uh, in Rome, for instance, uh, in the ancient Rome, the only statutes were if there were, like, an individual committed a crime against the state. Oh, and by the way, the state of nature is not a state in the sense of government, it's a, a condition of nature, I might say. Okay, now the, the, the Homer says that the, these judgments came first and then, uh, then customs developed out of them. However, these judgments uh, did not exist in a vacuum that uh, there is a vast oral tradition. Uh, in the Bible, for instance, uh, originally it came from oral tradition. A lot of the, the Homer, uh, Homer's uh, epics were originally oral, um, involving uh, right brain activity. You know, people would chant uh, songs and poems around the campfire, and it was passed on. Stories and legends were passed on like this. So I think it's, we have to say that the custom preceded the judgments, and the judgments were simply confirming the customs, even though there was some innovation. Um, the next step is that a lot of times the king might be weak or senile or something, and uh, what you had is an aristocracy of knowledge that kind of took the place of the king. This was at a stage when the laws were still unwritten. And most people didn't know what all the laws were because they couldn't travel. And uh, so the, the people who could do that uh, oftentimes became judges. Now, the later case law was, uh, was written down. Eventually, uh, it was codified. For instance, the original constitution of Rome was called the, the Law of Twelve Tables. And it was actually twelve brass plates upon which uh, the rights of people were written down. Now, these do not exist anymore. It's speculated that you know, one of the sackings of Rome, they were stolen, or perhaps one of the first emperors of Rome uh, destroyed it. But it was the constitution of Rome, and it was, was based on custom or a spontaneous order. Now, Rome degenerated into an empire, and then it, it fell, and then we had the feudalism, which is a transition to the modern era. The modern era being, of course, classical liberalism. The Declaration of Independence, which says these rights are from nature and nature's God. The Bill of Rights, which was uh, to uh, affirm the rights of the individuals. which was how the Federalists got the Constitution approved by promising a Bill of Rights. Now, if this common law is based on custom, then how does progress occur? Well, there's the law of equity, 
which was uh, based on right reason, symmetry, simplicity, equality. This is where we get the idea of the French and the Americans of all men are, are created equal. Uh, equal in the sense of they have equal rights because we're all humans. You also had uh, the case of the, just simply the conscience of the judge, or in England, the, uh, king's, court, the king's conscience, conscience whatever. Uh, in Rome, uh, this was, uh, came, the, this theory of equity came from the Greeks and it was applied uh, to these uh, customary laws in order to simplify them. Now, the John Locke and later a theorist borrowed from these ideas considerably. The 20th century, what we have is a, a reversion back to the empire. America is now an empire. Uh, it, things are done by executive order, bureaucratic regulations. For instance, the IRS can, can, uh, can simply pass, a, can simply put out a regulation. And there's a specific statute which says that every IRS regulation has the force of a statute. So basically, we were back to the uh, government by fiat, Bure whether it be bureaucrats or executives or whatever. And this is being used more and more in the war on drugs and is, is being used to bludgeon the uh, individual rights. So, if you have any uh, questions or comments, you may certainly start in on it. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh yeah, in fact, the Homestead Act uh, was really derived from the uh, Blackstone's uh, conception of mixing your person's labor with uh, unowned land. Uh, this goes back to the state of nature theories, where you're in a state of nature, the land is not claimed, you mix your labor with it, and you acquire uh, rights to it. Oh yeah, that's, that's uh, definitely uh, still going on, or it should be anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It's a very good point. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the original uh, prescription against uh, heroin and cocaine in around 1910 or 11. But in the case of marijuana, the first uh, anti-cannabis act was passed in 1937, and it was a tax act, so that uh, it was upheld as being constitutional because it was not prohibiting the cannabis. It was simply, so-called simply, taxing it. Well. Subsequent to that, uh, there has been no uh, serious uh, challenge to the uh, cannabis laws that have been able to make their way into the court system. There's an unwritten rule in the federal courts that is the government always wins, and the people who try to challenge it have been uh, squashed. And there's, it is unconstitutional, there's no question about it. I think that uh, the people who are enforcing these laws the drug enforcement agents, the Supreme Court justices, and the executives are in violation of the Constitution, they're in violation of natural law, and should be held accountable as in individuals. And of course, if that were to happen, there wouldn't be enough lampposts in Washington, D.C. to take care of all of them. Go ahead. I think as citizens, certainly not as libertarians, but as citizens, uh, people get confused about drug enforcement thinking it affects someone else, and it doesn't, it affects all of us. The example uh, is my brother-in-law who owned a very large boat that he kept at Puget Sound. 
his neighbor's boat was seized after a, a raid and one marijuana cigarette was found in the pocket of a crewman's jacket. So, you know, an innocent owner lost his boat. My brother-in-law realized that that kind of liability was not worth the investment that he had in the boat and he sold the boat. Um, I wonder how many other potential boat owners, and I know it certainly affected aircraft, small aircraft, have made the decision not to purchase equipment like that because they have no recourse. If exactly. If, so it does affect the people who make boats, the people who make airplanes. Uh, it's spreading out all over the country and its effects are, are really insidious. Yeah, and they're attempting to, uh, the government is so incompetent, they're trying to force the business owners, the property owners, into a position of doing their dirty work for them. I mean, the businessman already is collecting uh, taxes and isn't paid for it, and he has to do it, it's called withholding. Now we're also supposed to be social workers, and now we have to uh, be, be responsible for the end use of the product that we're selling, and the use of the property that we may own. And in fact, somebody uh, just read in the paper on the way out, flying out here, that this uh, fellow was uh, from Saudi Arabia and was married to an American woman, had, a, had kids and everything, and was in America to buy a truck and he had to drive to Houston with cash because he wanted a special customized truck and he, had to, well, he wanted to bring cash because he wasn't sure they would take an out-of-state check. So he brings $12,000, was pulled over for speeding and then his money was seized saying it was for drug money. Okay, well then once they seize it, then you have the burden of proof shifts. Then you have to prove to your innocent. Well, how do you prove a negative? How do you prove it wasn't for drugs? And see, all they have to do is say that there was probable cause to seize it, or even if there wasn't probable cause, that in, in reality, but if they had reason to believe there was probable cause, they can seize it, and then the burden of proof then shifts. Uh, there have been numerous examples of people, uh, person, uh, Mexican, American, having, uh, bringing cash to buy nursery plants for his business, and the, most of the small nursery growers uh, use cash. Uh, and his money was seized, and he's, he's having trouble now. And you wind up spending more on attorney fees than what it's worth. Uh, I, I've spent a lot of money, a lot of money on uh, attorneys, uh, and it, it really, really, there's no way you can come on ahead of that. And you don't get those, that money back usually. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, as an extension of this uh, same use of illegitimate authority, I recently participated in a massive rally in Santa Fe, New Mexico by the uh, holistic and alternative medicine people. Ah, yeah. um, you may be familiar with the case of this Washington physician. Oh yeah, I know. Him. Whose yeah. clinic was raided. He just happened to be a libertarian that mm -hmm. may or may not have had something to do with it. But at gunpoint they knocked down, they broke down his doors and he, they terrorized mm -hmm. his 21 person staff and his patients. And wow confiscated all of his vitamins and uh, herbs and medicine and his records and his computers. Right. And to this day, n not, none of that has been returned and he has not been really charged with anything, to my knowledge. Right. Right. That, the history of that case is that, <clears throat> uh, that L-tryptophan you know, is a natural product. It's found in milk and it has therapeutic or nutritional uses. Uh, it also has uh, a mild uh, stimulating effect or a euphoric effect, if you take it straight. Now, if it's refined, it can also be used uh, as a mind-altering uh, substance, if, if you know how to refine it, which is very few, few people do. But the, uh, there was one batch in Japan that was contaminated, and they made the, the, the DEA made the whole thing illegal, L-tryptophan, and they seized his inventory of L-tryptophan a couple of years ago, even though it had been certified by the Mayo Clinic as being free of this contaminant. And for instance, he does a lot of injectable vitamins. Well, the vitamin B, as made in the United States, has artificial preservatives in it, so it's not really safe to inject it. So he had to buy some from West Germany, and they said he was smuggling the drug, the vitamin B in, because it was not, did not have an English label on it. Well, you know, if the U.S. government can't afford to hire some German-speaking people, they shouldn't be going around uh, seizing their inventory. Uh, then what happens, they seize everything, and then you're deprived of your means of making a living, 
or you're, you're crippled, and that means you have less money to pay attorneys, you're less able to, tr to fight it, and most people just cave in. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. Just a quick comment. Um, as far as you reminded me that people aren't charged with this, the Pittsburgh Press did a study and found that 80% of the people who had seizures were never charged with a crime. Yeah, it's, it's a way of getting money. It goes back to the old uh, piracy era where you just take somebody's uh, property. Now, it should be remembered that uh, cannabis sativa was routinely prescribed in the 19th century and the early 20th century for. Uh, for uh, menstrual cramps, for uh, headaches, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you can imagine what would happen to the sales of aspirin and other uh, pharmaceutical products. Uh, now, the other thing is it has industrial uses. Uh, for instance, the original Levi's were made with, with hemp, which is the fiber of the plant. And of course, hemp is much stronger than cotton. And the original Levi's, where they show the, the two donkeys pulling it apart, well, you do that with cotton, it would just rip. And it's just amazing how the, this, uh, just as hemp was about to become more commercially viable with new, new, new processing machinery, and about the same time that DuPont came out with artificial rayon and synthetic fibers. It's just amazing how, yeah, the prohibition of alcohol ends. We have a bunch of unemployed bureaucrats. Hemp was starting to come into its own at the same time that these, these artificial uh, fibers were coming about. And uh, Hearst, the newspaper chain, had vast uh, timber holdings, which would be devalued uh, considerably if hemp became more commercially viable. And then all of a sudden we had this, this uh, reefer madness scare, which resulted in the 1937 uh, passing of the Tax Act. Well, and then we had a brief respite in World War II, where it was the government, uh, Department of Agriculture encouraged its growth for um, cordage and ropes. And then after... Uh, the 50s, it kind of died, everybody kind of forgot about it, except for a few jazz musicians. And then when uh, middle class kids started smoking marijuana in the 60s, there was just a big uh, hysteria. And, uh, you know, uh, many of these anti-drug uh, commercials that you see on billboards and television in the United States are funded by the uh, uh, alcohol and tobacco companies. And you can just imagine uh, their, their motive. Yeah. I think maybe our only hope is uh, the absurdity to which these drug enforcement officers take this. In southeastern Idaho, there was a local, local drug officer whose department, salary, and expenses depended upon the receipts of seizure um, properties th that had been seized. And he was running out of money, so he had 27 indictments before a county judge to refurnish his his uh, department budget, and the judge realized that that was the reason none of these indictments uh, had any clear justification. And he not only refused to hear the indictments, but um, you know used what influence he had to make sure that this in drug enforcement officer was fired. So I mean, they they become so blatant about their activity that the seizure of property is really for their own personal benefit. Yeah, the judges are beginning to, most of them are, are, you know, appointed, not elected, but still, even the judges are becoming upset with this, but there's not much they can do about it because they want to get promoted, and the source of the executive branch does the promotions. Uh, and those are the exceptions when they start uh, limiting it. Uh, the rule is that they just do more and more, and it's just getting, uh, it's getting quite crazy. Uh, yeah, Mary? Just another quick comment. It's not only in the drug area. There was a lady who had was was, uh, was thought to have stolen $500 of UPS packages, and they seized her home and her cars. And she's now started an organization in the United States called Fear to try to uh, you know get this stuff stopped. So it's not even in drug enforcement anymore. It's basically anything. Yeah, and the reason the police are not that interested in going after. I think all the drugs should be legal because the problems of hard drugs are mostly associated with the illegality, the price being higher, necessitating theft, and disputes over, uh, over drug deals, et cetera. But even so, I mean, uh, I think it's kind of interesting to note that the police are not as likely to go after a crack dealer because he usually does not own a house and has no real property. They like to go after cannabis growers because the people are growing in their, in their houses typically that they may own. Those houses can be, can be seized. You can be thrown out of your, your 
you can be homeless, become homeless because you want to grow your own uh, pot. Yeah. Um, an another comment on that. Um, I, I own some property in, in the poor side of town that I had gotten back on land contract and we were trying to clean it up. We had drug dealers making deals in the yard and of course they were also destroying the property. So we called the police and told them about this, hoping they'd at least remove them. They said, no, we can't do that because any one of your tenants could claim they invited them there and we couldn't do anything so we're not going to bother. So what you're saying about how they go after people with money is definitely true. Yeah. Now, there's something called Weed and Seed Program, which is a pilot program in Seattle where they're trying to federalize uh, the street-level de dealing of, cra of these uh, crack. And what happens is they have something called drug-free zones, where it's within a certain number of distant feet of a school or a playground that the fines and penalties are, are all doubled. Well, in the central city, because of the density of the buildings, uh, most of the areas in a central city are, are in drug-free zones. So what happens is when you, when you federalize these crimes, you have an enormous number of poor, typically black street dealers who do not have the money to pay for attorneys, and they're just rounded up in these massive uh, raids, and uh, it's going to start um, filling up the prisons at a much faster rate. And what happens is when the prisons are at capacity, and these are very expensive, it costs about uh, $30,000 a year to main somebody, maintain somebody in a prison. They're talking about military camps. Well, military camps, abandoned military bases are not secure facilities. And they start, they start jacking the penalties up. For instance, I know a person who uh, let a friend of his use his phone, and the guy used the phone to make a drug deal for cocaine. They both had to be Colombians. He got 21 years for conspiracy. Uh, someone, another instance where somebody is uh, driving a car and somebody's doing a drug deal in the back seat in a different language that he can't even understand, but because he was facilitating, said to be facilitating the deal because he was driving around in the car, that he, he got charged. Uh, if you just see some activity or tempted drug sales going in, you're supposed to report them. Uh, what's going to happen is the prisons are going to get full up and more and more people are going to escape from them. Right now in the city of Portland, or uh, the federal district of Portland, uh, the people, because they have a, like a zero tolerance policy there, because Oregon uh, was considered a uh, risky state, they were going liberal on pot in the early 70s, and the feds were afraid that, that, that it would drift in a liberal direction, so they start, became a targeted state. They put in attorney, U.S. attorneys there who had zero tolerance, so more people were charged with smaller amounts federally. The federal penalties are much stiffer, and the resources the federal government has are just enormous. They have unlimited staff, unlimited budget. They just go in there and just, they just run you over. Well, what happens is, is that uh, typically now, of uh, the people who are charged with a federal drug crime, only half of them are released prior to trial. And of those who are released, only half show up for further proceedings. So this is really overloading the U.S. Marshal's office and typically uh, they're less able now to go after bank robbers and kidnappers because uh, most of the uh, federal offenses now, about 80% of them are drug related. Uh, usually a sale of drugs. Uh, and so this is gonna over, it's already overloading the system. If the laws are not changed, the US government will fall. It will collapse. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what's going to take the place of it, uh, but I think that they will have to change the laws. And of course, uh, by experience, we know that these things don't work, and so this gets us back to the natural law theory. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to share uh, something I did uh, for a few years that I would recommend to others if you have the stomach for it. I got a job several years ago for the Salt Lake City Police Department as a dispatcher. And in that position, I took incoming calls from people who wanted to report drug dealers, uh, prostitutes, uh, various other victimless crimes, and I would take the information and throw it away. <laughs> and that, that, that's, that's just... That's just inefficient bureaucracy. I, what can I say? I mean, you know, and any just, computer programmers out there, when I work for the IRS, you could do quite a nice job. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, there's, Salt Lake City's a city of a half a million, and there is real crime there, and so I would always just throw it away, and I did this for f over four years without getting caught. They finally got me on a, a drunk driver report. <laughs> Some girl called from a, a convenience store saying, there's a man in here who's really drunk, he's going to get in his car and leave, and I thought, well, mm, you know. <laughs> I figure if he's so drunk he gets in a wreck, we'll catch him, and if he if he's, you know, makes it home, okay, then it's a victimless crime. So I let it, I just let that one slide too. And they they uh, the poli a policeman finally came to the convenience store an hour later to buy some coffee, and uh, she says, "Well, it took you long enough to get here." And he, the man just left and all this kind of stuff. And he said, "What are you talking about?" And so they checked into it and they went back and listened to the tapes of the phone conversation. I said, "Well, gee, I must have hit the wrong button on the computer." and erased it, so I didn't get in any trouble really. They just said, well, watch it, you know. And, well, uh, yeah, well, of course, once the roads are privatized, the, yeah. the private owners would be able to establish their own re regulations through a contractual relationship with the uh, users of the road. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly, uh, of course, there would be different roads then too, high-risk roads and low-risk roads, and I think that it certainly is a serious thing to endanger life and, and property uh, under the influence of any uh, substances. Now, I wanted to ask also, do you have any comments about mandatory sentencing? Yeah, that's the other thing. The federal judges are very upset about this uh, because they have very little downward discretion. They have upward discretion. They can increase the sentence beyond the guidelines, but it's very difficult for them to go below the guidelines. And the guidelines are a very, very, very complicated formula involving the number of plants, the weight of the product you're selling, prior convictions, and there's a whole range of variables that goes into a grid and it changes uh, virtually every year, usually it gets worse. Although most of these really bad laws were passed in the 80s and we're kind of reaching a plateau now where they're simply trying to enforce the existing laws which are already really bad. What happens is that if you have a bunch of small plants, let's say you have rooted cuttings, you may have a hundred of them, well each plant is considered to be two pounds no matter what size it is, and that translates into an X number of months. In my case, with the 18 counts that I was hit up with, uh, I could have served a maximum of 234 years. Now, I, with my plea bargain, I've got it down to a maximum of 113 years. So, I think that's a big improvement. Of course, in my particular case, the plea bargain that I had was uh, prior, which allowed for probation, but in most cases that does not happen. They, it's a mandatory minimum and they have to do the time and this just knowledge of this is just now hitting the streets and people are becoming more and more aware of it and they're simply uh, going on the lam. They're simply, like me for instance, it's very unusual for a convicted felon like myself uh, to be allowed out of the United States. I had to get a federal judge to sign a minute order and to a lot of, uh, I had to pull a lot of strings, believe me, and it um, involved uh, min uh, massaging the prosecutor. Uh, I happened to have caught him in a number of procedural violations, so it was kind of a, um, uh, kind of twisted his arm a little bit, and my <clears throat> through a lot of attorney money, I was able to, um, I was able to get permission to leave the country, but, um, uh, I'm the exception. Most most people um, I, I get shafted if they're you know, poor or black or whatever. And I'm I'm being shafted bad enough. I mean, you know. So. Okay, enjoy.